It is my great pleasure to introduce um, the Right Honourable Nikki Morgan MP, uh, DCMS Secretary of State, of course, under uh, our new Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. And I joked a little earlier with her that she must be the last remaining out-remainer in the Cabinet at the moment. Um, she's only been in post since July. This we are honoured, uh, will be her first speech on broadcasting policy since taking office. She's extremely experienced in government. Uh, she's been at the Treasury, she's been the Secretary of State for Education, uh, Minister for Women and Equalities. Um, and, you know, at some point I'd like to ask you, when will the general election be? Uh, but perhaps we'll hear from you uh, about that after your speech. So, Nikki Morgan, Secretary of State. Well, uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Susanna, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, let's see if I can come up with an answer for you by the time I sit down, maybe not. Um, Sharon, it's a pleasure to have followed you. And I think that um, uh, based on the interview that everyone has just heard, uh, that John Lewis's gain is going to be very much our loss. So we're sorry, I'm sorry to see you go, but I wish you the very best in your new role. So it is a real pleasure to, to be here, and I'm thrilled that my first major speech as Secretary of State is here at the Royal Television Society Conference. The motto of the University of Cambridge, where we gather today, can be translated as, from this place we gain enlightenment and precious knowledge. Now, I'm going to leave it up to you to be the judge of how much enlightenment and precious knowledge I can deliver for you today. But this ethos of enlightenment was certainly shared by the pioneers who shaped our television sector. They had a vision for how the content and experiences offered by our broadcasters can fuel the discourse of our nation, help make us all more informed and more inspired, and support our cultural health and well-being. And despite the myriad of changes we've seen since these early years, our television sector remains the envy of the world. But we must never be complacent. Everyone with an interest in the future of our broadcasters, producers and creative talents must think carefully about the changes that will be needed to ensure that you continue to grow and develop in the years ahead. How can we create the right conditions for the sector to thrive, but also how can we make sure its considerable benefits can be felt fair, far and wide? And that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. How we must all adapt, as we've already heard, whatever role we play to maintain the treasure that is our television sector. And there are three areas that I see as important. First, let me start with our broadcasters. Now, we are rightly proud of the vibrant mix of broadcasters we have here in the UK. And this government is determined to see a strong and successful future for our public service broadcasters and commercial broadcasters alike. I really value the important contribution that they all make to our public life, particularly at a time when civil discourse is increasingly under strain. Disinformation, fueled by hermetically sealed online echo chambers, is threatening the foundations of the truth that we all rely on. And the tenor of public conversations, especially those on social media, has become increasingly toxic and hostile. So we need to treasure and encourage the robust news and high quality content and the programmes that bring us together, provided by our PSBs and our commercial broadcasters. I realise it is a challenging time for some of those long established organisations. New ways of producing and consuming content are emerging faster than ever before, and people are watching what they want, where they want, when they want. Now, no one can deny the benefits of an explosion of choice and a competitive market. But British broadcasters are central pillars of our public life, and their benefits are too great for them to be cast off as victims in this revolution. Just ask all the people who have transformed their use of plastic thanks to the persuasive and compelling story of the BBC's Planet Earth. And the 4,500 schools, that's over 1 million children, who have signed up to ITV's Daily Mile, Daily Mile Fitness campaign. And the people all around the world living under repressive regimes 
who have turned to British news as a lifeline and a source of information. Now, our mission is to retain all of these positive economic, cultural and soft power benefits at a time when the broadcasting landscape is changing like never before. Now, according to Ofcom, YouTube is now the first choice for video content for children over the age of eight. And over half of us have a subscription to a video on demand service, each of which on average offers 22 million hours of content. So our broadcasters must be as fleet-footed and as adaptable to change as their international competitors. Because those that do not pool their resources and talent will find it difficult to succeed in this new age. So it's been heartening to me to see our PSBs working together across traditional boundaries, including on exciting new platforms, just as they did with Freeview 17 years ago. And BritBox is a fantastic example of this, and I'm looking forward to its launch in the coming months. PSBs have also been increasingly working together with their commercial counterparts. For example, Channel 4 and Sky have made a number of successful agreements recently, including joining forces so as many viewers as possible could see the thrilling Cricket World Cup final this summer, captivating a whole new audience. I am sure that our PSBs and commercial broadcasters can continue to do more together in terms of producing content, working with advertisers and innovating to reach audiences of all ages. That's why, as you heard, Ofcom is undertaking a review to look at how well the BBC's news and current affairs output is adapting to the changing news environment, and why I am delighted that ITV is launching an exciting news service on social media targeted at younger, younger audiences. Because we all need to be constantly adapting if this sector is to remain sustainable and to meet audience expectations. Now, another way we can achieve these goals is through making sure our broadcasters represent the country they serve both on and off screen. Now, we've just heard a lot about diversity. I'm sure this is not going to be the first time that you've heard a DCMS Secretary of State talking about it. But it's been a real passion of mine throughout that career that Susanna has talked about. And I see it as fundamental to our success and as a future as a nation. Throughout my career, I've been banging the drum for fair representation across all of our industries. And as you heard, I was proud to serve as Minister for Women and Equalities for two years. Representation is particularly important for our broadcasters, not just because it's right and just, but because our broadcasters, I believe, are most effective and most relevant when they channel the diversity of perspectives and backgrounds that make this country great. And to achieve that aim, you need to hire people who can reflect this and also make sure that they are in the rooms where important decisions are made. So today's Ofcom report shows that while progress has been made in some areas, including in senior management gender balance and minority ethnic representation, there remains more to do. So I want to see all broadcasters working harder to promote diversity of all kinds at all levels. And the Creative Industries Council's newly announced diversity charter is a strong statement of intent, includes a number of positive commitments. Regional diversity is also vital, and Channel 4 will soon be opening new offices in Leeds, Bristol and Glasgow as part of a commendable effort to increase its regional impact. And I also welcome the creative steps that commercial broadcasters have taken to promote a diverse industry and economy. For example, Sky's Innovation Centre, which is providing girls of school leaving age the chance to learn coding for free. I want to say to our commercial broadcasters, you too are central to our television sector. Non-PSB broadcasters are now investing more than £1.1 billion a year in UK content. This is a sector that delivers culturally and economically and provides for all audiences. So please, keep investing, keep finding new and diverse talent, and keep deepening the roots that you have developed in the UK. Expectations are changing, not just around what and who we see on our screens, but also around how these shows are produced. In the digital age, the spotlight can be intense for those who take part in popular shows. Viewers have easy access to participants via social media, and video clips can last forever, meaning fame can be an overwhelming experience for many people. And I am pleased that broadcasters have recognised this and are putting steps in place to reduce potential harm. I welcome the Ofcom consultation in this area, 
and the progress that our broadcasters have been making. And we will also look carefully at the DCMS Select Committee's findings when they report later this year. Just as our broadcasters set a global standard in so many areas, I want to see them doing the same for how they treat their participants. Now, the second area where we need to adapt is the support offered by government and regulators. We need to make sure that regulations, some of which were developed in the analogue age, are fit for the new ways that people create and consume content. While I welcome the growing role of video on demand services and the investment and consumer choice they bring, it is important that we have regulatory frameworks that reflect this new environment. For example, whereas a program airing on linear TV is subject to Ofcom's broadcasting code and the audience protections it contains, a program going out on most video on demand services is not subject to the same standards. This does not provide the clarity and consistency that consumers would expect. So I'm interested in considering how regulation should change to reflect a changing sector. And that's just one example. Now Ofcom, as we've heard, is beginning its PSB review, and I have asked Ofcom to think big. In terms of what might be needed to ensure that the PSB system can meet audiences' needs, find the best new talent, and provide the critical mass of investment that is vital to drive the success of UK television. But this is not a zero-sum issue. A healthy PSB system should benefit and not diminish other parts of our sector. And Ofcom's upcoming review will help us consider how regulation can ensure PSBs continue to be the beating heart of our television landscape for years to come. It's in this vein that I will consider the issue of prominence, as you've heard again, that's so important for our PSBs. Ofcom has made its initial recommendations. My officials will be working with Ofcom and the industry to look at how to take them forward with a view to legislation. And a further area where regulation may need to be updated is the PSB multiplex licenses which underpin the Freeview platform. These will expire in 2022 and I intend to consult in the new year on a range of options for these specific licenses. But I also want to emphasize that any regulation must be proportionate and evidence-based. And that's the approach I'm gonna take with the recent consultation on potential further advertising restrictions on food products that are high in fat, salt, or sugar. I do understand broadcasters' concerns here, and I will consider the evidence submitted to the consultation carefully before any decisions are taken. That is not to say there is no role for broadcasters and others in tackling obesity, one of the great public health issues of our times. But broadcasters already play a big part, including by inspiring people from all backgrounds to emulate their sporting heroes through their coverage of major sporting events. And the government can help to support these twin ambitions of participation and representation through the listed events regime. Now, we don't intend to undertake a full review of the regime, but we do want to give equal recognition to disabled and women's sports. Firstly, this nation has a long-standing commitment to para-sport. The UK hosted what is widely considered the first ever Paralympic Games in 1948. And the London 2012 Paralympics was widely considered the greatest of all time, supported, of course, by Channel 4's groundbreaking coverage. And now, just like the Olympics, we are consulting on adding the Paralympic Games to the listed events regime. Secondly, the recent Women's World Cup showed the energy and passion that women's sport can generate. A record-breaking 28.1 million people tuned in to the BBC's coverage of the tournament on TV and online. I want to build on this momentum and make sure that future generations of female sporting talent can be inspired by what they see on their screens. So today I can announce that I have written to the relevant rights holders to seek their views about adding women's sporting events to the listed events regime. So where a man's event is listed, the woman's equivalent would be two. I believe this will be an important step in giving female sporting talent the coverage they deserve and putting men's and women's sport on an equal footing at last. Now I've set out how I believe broadcasters must adapt to the changing market and how government and regulators can support this change. And so the third area I want to talk about today is the UK's production sector. 
There is a lengthy and talented supply chain that sits behind everything we see on our screens. From producers to editors to designers, we have forged a reputation as a world-class destination to create and produce content with an attractive tax landscape and a truly vibrant creative skills base. And this has led to substantial infrastructure investment at Warner Brothers Studios, Leavesden and Pinewood, with further developments in the pipeline at Elstree and elsewhere. The investment from commercial broadcasters and streaming giants, combined with the continued investment from PSBs, has created unprecedented opportunities for our production sector. I warmly welcome this vote of confidence in the UK, and the results have been exceptional. Overall, film inward investment in the UK has grown by 92% in the last five years, and high-end television by 162%. And spending from all areas, including significant growth from the international on-demand services, has helped revenue for the UK TV production sector now reach three billion pounds. So I'm delighted that we've got the CEOs of Netflix and Discovery here this week, amongst many others, a great endorsement of the breadth of the UK's offering. I hope to see these new players growing and expanding across the UK and taking advantage of our thriving regional creative economies. As a government, we will be looking closely at the barriers to growth that I know concern all producers. Our creative sector tax reliefs have already supported nearly £15 billion of production expenditure, as well as stimulating increased tourism across the UK. But we cannot rest on our laurels, particularly at a time of increased and intense international competition. And so to stay on top, we are working to give ourselves the studio space and the skilled workers we need so the UK remains at the forefront of global screen production. This is a pivotal moment for our country, and we all have a part to play in setting out the right path for broadcasters, policymakers, regulators, and producers. At a time when it feels as if our society is getting more polarized and more tribal, the content we watch can bring us together through creating moments of shared enjoyment and inspiration. And you, our broadcasters, our producers, our creative talent, help us to pro project our creativity and ingenuity beyond our shores. You represent our great country at its best. The captivating drama that enthralls so many people and offers them a glimpse of the history and beauty of our nation. The award-winning documentaries which have changed attitudes and driven lasting change across the world and the bravery and fearlessness shown by so many of our broadcast journalists, often in the most perilous of circumstances overseas. So I'm very proud to be representing this sector and you in Westminster and Whitehall, a sector which is steeped in heritage and achievement and is constantly breaking new ground in terms of new formats and new technology. A sector which not only makes an important cultural and social contribution to our lives, but is also a driving force for our economy. Throughout history, you have shown the ability to adapt to the world around you, and I have no doubt that you will do so in the years ahead. A healthy media is the sign of a healthy civil society and a thriving nation. And I want to work side by side with you all to make sure that this industry remains sustainable, relevant, and open to everyone. It is one of the great challenges of our age, but together, it can be done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Secretary of State. Um, I'm just going to quickly look at the clock because I'm very mindful of the fact that in light of what Julie had said um, in the wake of that uh, Dorothy Byrne lecture at the Edinburgh Television Festival yes. and uh, criticising some politicians and leaders for <laughs> not having their feet held to the fire, I know that you are about to go down and be grilled by Peston, Peston yep. this evening and you need to get on a train. I do. Uh, and you are hanging around now to take questions from the audience audience and I'm going to ask you a couple of questions first but we are very limited on time I know, I know. Um, so many points came up in in Sharon Julie's session so I want to address some of those first a, a, a critical report on diversity in this industry yep. um, you have been women and equalities minister um, you're a high profile woman doing a job where you're you know you have a, a no sight of, of this an interest in this industry why is there not enough diversity in television? 
Well, I'm not sure I've got the, the answer having only just come into the, the job. It's not a sector, obviously, that I have worked in uh, previously, but based on my um, uh, previous experiences in, in, in politics, uh, which is not diverse enough, in financial services, which is uh, not diverse enough, um, I think sometimes we've left it to others to think about uh, encouraging. I mean, Sharon talked at the end there about mentors and people who've been influential in her career. You know, we shouldn't underestimate the importance of, certainly in politics, I've found, you have to go out and find the talent, um, particularly women, but often people from underrepresented uh, groups. Um, it's not enough just to say we're launching this program or we're going to do this or whatever. You've actually got to go out and, and find people. There's no doubt um, that in other sectors like financial services, issues around unconscious bias. So when you're recruiting, mm -hmm. it's really easy, particularly depending if you leave recruitment to middle managers for whom actually taking a risk is not going to be thanked if it goes wrong. So it's much easier to recruit in your own image or the image of the person who you are replacing. So changing recruitment uh, practices. Um, but, but it is also about, I mean, there's an incumbent, there's, a, there's something incumbent on all of us, isn't there, if you are a high profile person, to try to do your bit as well. Because actually, one of the most profound comments I heard recently, it's not a new one, is you can't be what you can't see. And so actually, it's really important. I mentioned about having voices in the room. You know, people in your organizations, they need to see young women, people from, young people from BME backgrounds, people with disabilities, they need to see people like them in senior positions. Um, Ofcom, as we heard, uh, want more powers to collect uh, more data yeah. on diversity. Are you granting those? Um, we're not planning to uh, legislate at the moment, but I hear very much what Sharon said, and we've discussed it. Um, and um, I accept the challenge that she left me with quite a lot of legislation. I would just say that the Chief <laughs> Whip would tell me that legislation is challenging at the moment to get through the House of Commons, uh, having the whip myself. Um, but um, but I, I hear what she said. And look, and it's, it's up to, I said, you know, I'm proud to represent this sector in Westminster to Whitehall. It's my job to go out and make the case for why actually gathering more diversity statistics uh, would help to make a difference and make the case. You talked about, um, you know, we've become much more tribal and obviously because of Brexit, we're so divided. You also made a very good point about, you know, we, we're sort of operating in sealed online echo chambers, mm -hmm. which threaten the foundations of truth that we all rely on. Of course, that's a responsibility for broadcasters. But it, isn't it also a responsibility for politicians? I mean, one of the things we hear so often on Good Morning Britain is during the campaign, there were lies told on both sides. Yeah. And those were lies coming from the mouths of politicians. And those are complaints made by viewers that they feel that they were just fed a whole load of disinformation, misinformation. What can you do <laughs> about that? Your own colleagues. Well, I think obviously to... <laughs> To challenge. Look, I, look, I accept your, the premise of your uh, question in the sense that you're absolutely right. Of course, it's for politicians, all of us involved, to accept that the last uh, three and a half years has left the country more divided than I think people have seen at any point in living memory. I was, I was struck today by the comments, that certainly in the Times, I don't know if there are anyone else, that David Dimbleby interviewing people outside the court yesterday saying he could not remember coming across the country as divided. Mm -hmm. now, in fact, I have to run the gauntlet uh, of people on both sides of the debate all, all the time. Um, I think we will need, um, we, we've obviously got a, a turbulent period, well, an unpredictable period uh, mm -hmm. coming up. When this first phase is, is brought to a conclusion, I think there will have to be a very hard, long look at ourselves, at all of this, what happened, how we conduct uh, campaigns. Obviously, there's issues around online uh, messages as well, what's put online, how we think we we win elections and everything. It's incumbent on all of us, and it's part of my role, I think, very much as DCMS Secretary of State, this whole issue of disinformation, the impact of different platforms, what people say on democracy. Uh, when's the general election, by the way? Sadly, my, my crystal ball hasn't yet swung into action. <laughs> so, uh, but, um, but yeah, we'd, we'd all like to, to know that question. And, and once we know, will there be televised leaders' debates? I'm pretty sure there, there will be. I think it, my personal view is it's one of those things that's out of the box now, it'd be impossible to put back. Mm. Okay, so that's my questions done. Let me throw it open to the floor. Um, who would like to ask a question of the Secretary of State? Here, over, there. over here, please. Mike Finch is coming. And if you can say who you are, obviously, and where you're uh, from. Simon Albright campaign for broadcasting equality. I was delighted to get a letter from Nigel Adams last week that said the department and you would consider secondary legislation uh, to support Ofcom on the diversity data deficit. Now, I'm not sure whether I should interpret what you said as pulling back from that, but reading uh, uh, the report today, yeah. uh, the commentary 
that has written, been written by Sharon White and her officials is most impressive. But the data which is supplied by the broadcasters is poor to inadequate mm. to non-existent to missing. Uh, and clearly, Sharon has talked about extending the characteristics but we also need to see an extension of the quality. Yeah. And you yourself have yeah. talked about the importance of evidence-based regulation. The evidence is dreadful. So will you give consideration to secondary legislation to improve the quality of the evidence as well as the range of characteristics? The short answer to your question is yes, um, but um, as I say, uh, legislation at the moment um, is, well, I mean, personally, it is just challenging in the current parliamentary environment. Uh, but also, in my experience, legislation is not, it, it can be, it's part of the answer. But there is nothing to stop broadcasters on a voluntary basis dramatically improving the quality of the, the data that is supplied or widening out the characteristics that are asked about. I think the Creative Industries Council's charter, which I mentioned in my speech, is a really important step forward. Um, my previous role as um, Financial Services Chair of the House of Commons Treasury Select Committee, the Women in Finance Charter, launched by the Treasury, was, was a really key moment, actually, in getting companies to think much harder. That was obviously gender-based, uh, but there might be something similar as well that we can do while we're waiting for the legislative bus to come along. Next question. Oh, we've got one up here, if we can get a... You're going to challenge the microphone. Here we yes. are. He's coming. He's Here running. <laughs> Hi, I'm Joe Mays from Bloomberg. So a, a no-deal Brexit is of particular concern to yeah. the media sector. I was wondering, how comfortable do you feel serving under a prime minister who says that he will intend to deliver a no-deal Brexit on October 31st, come what may, despite the will of Parliament, if he can't get a deal from Brussels? Well, obviously, there's a whole raft of questions uh, there that we could spend some time uh, talking about. Look, in the end, for this particular sector, in the event of there being a no-deal Brexit, uh, then we would uh, be part of the uh, European Convention on Transfrontier Television, uh, which does uh, quite a lot of the uh, AV MSD uh, that we would otherwise be opted uh, into. Um, so I think that I understand, obviously, concerns in the sector, particularly around things like attracting talent, uh, and also, obviously, in terms of... Uh, you know, being able to get uh, goods there and out of the country. I mean, I think the wider point, though, is, and, and clearly um, I have thought very hard as, a, as an individual MP, I think we all have, over the course of the last three years, I voted to and campaigned to remain. But um, my constituency voted pretty well 50-50 in the referendum. And I do think that actually when people, though, have uh, voted in a particular way, uh, they do expect that result to be implemented. I think we are into very difficult territory if we end up making it look like MPs in Parliament second-guess public votes. We can debate the wisdom of uh, referenda for deciding issues uh, such as this. And I fully support the Prime Minister in saying we, we have got to bring the last three and a half years to a close. We are deeply divided as a country. Uh, this is only the first phase, in a sense, of depending on what happens. We end up negotiating uh, free trade agreements or being in a, a transition period. The Prime Minister has also made it very, very clear that his preference is to have a deal. And I believe on the basis of my work on the alternative arrangements that a deal is possible, but clearly that requires pragmatism and goodwill on all sides, and that's why the next few weeks are critical. Mm. Um, we've run out of time, and you have <laughs> to catch the train. Uh, it's been delightful having you here. Thank you very much indeed, Secretary of State. When you, I, I asked it of my own boss, when you collapse on the sofa and you stop watching the news and you stopped answering questions about Brexit, um, what is it that you binge on in terms of TV or what do you love to watch? What do I love to watch? Um, so I love, uh, I mean, my, my Saturday nights are now fulfilled for next, between now and Christmas because Strictly is back. So that is my, right. I, I, um, I'll be very antisocial, more so than I am normally. If you gave up politics, would you bid to be on Strictly? Is that an invitation? <laughs> I don't have the power. I've done it. I can highly recommend it. I would love to do it. Um, but anyway, that's, um, I, I think that, uh, I'm not sure that's a good space for politicians to go. <laughs> I've, got, I've got my team are just going, oh, I can't believe you just said that. Anne um, Widdicombe was one of the stars of Strictly, so, well, of course. It was, it was, um, what else? Uh, Line of Duty, um, I, I adored. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing The Crown. 
Um, I'm hoping that deep water is still on the ITV hub because I haven't watched it or haven't managed to catch up with it. Um, frankly, anything that doesn't involve the words news, Brexit or politics <laughs> really is a, is a good thing. <laughs> well, thanks for addressing all of those things with us. <laughs> Nikki Morgan, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. So nice to see you. Thank you.